entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. The Breeders Academy proudly presents Bread to Perfection with Kenny Troiano. A show for serious breeders. Whether you are looking to create a new strain or simply improve an old one, you have come to the right place. Daddy, I want more chicken. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, here's your host, Kitty Triano. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Bread to Perfection. My name is Kenny Troiano, and this, my friends, is the podcast devoted to helping you become a better breeder and taking your strain to the next level. That's right, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are brand new to breeding or you've been breeding for many years. There is something all of us can do to improve our fowl for future generations. Where the hell have you been, soldier? Training, sir! I see. So am I to understand that you men completed your training on your own? That's the fact, Jack! That's the fact, Jack! Okay, welcome to another episode of Brett's Perfection. I'm your uh, host, Kenny Triano, and I'm with my co-host, Frank Bradley. I'd like to invite you to join the Breeders Academy. Just go to www.breedersacademy.com to register. Also join us for my free newsletter, which is my Breeders Bulletin. A lot of freebies there. You get a lot of free eBooks and a lot of free tips, information. So today is going to be really interesting because it's one of those topics that they mess up the most breeding and feeding. And they just seem to get it, not just wrong, but they get it so wrong. And uh, there's just a lot of misconceptions, a lot of old wives tales kind of get people all messed up. And so I think we're going to try to show people what they're all about. But I want you to also understand that these are just methods by themselves. They don't accomplish a whole lot. They have a function. They have a purpose, each one of them. But to use them properly, you need to use them in a proper breeding program. And that doesn't mean only use inbreeding. That doesn't mean only use line breeding. It means using multiple methods to achieve a specific result. So it's a matter of knowing what method at what time and for how long. So that's not what we're going to cover today, but we're going to break down many of the methods that exist and kind of give you an idea what they're all about. Now, there's going to be a few methods that I'm going to exclude because we go much further into uh, those methods inside the Breeders Academy. And they have a lot to do with the Founders Program as well. Matter of fact, without them, the Founders Program wouldn't exist. The ones we're going to talk about today are going to be crossbreeding, outcrossing, which means different things to different people depending on what kind of bird you raise. Backcrossing, which is used for the wrong reasons. In and inbreeding, which a lot of people use but don't understand how it's used. There's a lot of people who don't understand that method and think it's the way to go because it's a safer approach when in truth it doesn't really accomplish a whole lot. Then there's inbreeding, which there's a lot of misconceptions about. Frank can tell you that it's the one program and course inside the Breeders Academy that people go to right away. And I usually encourage them to do that because inbreeding scares a lot of people. They don't really understand. They see inbreeding as scary. They see it as damaging. They see it as destructive. And it's a great tool, but you got to use it properly. And we'll talk about that. Line breeding. A lot of people mix up line breeding with back crossing. Clan mating, which is a, a great rotational system, but it has its limitations. And I don't think it's one that should be used by itself. And then we're going to talk about double mating, which I'm not a big promoter of because I don't think it's the best way to create a strain. I think some people use it when they're showing birds in exhibition, because as far as some breeds are concerned, it's the only way to get what they want. So I've skipped raising some breeds because it required double mating, and that's just not the way I want to go. Then we're going to talk about one that people use but don't understand what it's all about, or they're using it but don't know they're using it. 
and it, it's beneficial in some ways, but also detrimental in others. And you should know that it exists. And that's recombinant reciprocal selection. And if we can get to it, because we have a lot of material here, grading, grading up, which is a great method for taking mongrels, a flock of mixed birds, and actually creating a strain from that. And it just takes some time. And like I said, we did a podcast on this episode. I think it was called What You Don't Know About Breeding Methods. So if you want to learn more about it, go into my podcast, Bread to Perfection, listen to that, and we go much more in depth. As you know, this is like a conversation, and we never know if we're going to get through the whole program. So sometimes they just don't get covered like I would like them to get covered. Frank, let's talk about crossbreeding. I would say this is the main method that most people use. But for the wrong reasons. And I think it's what's tearing down the strain. It's tearing down the breed, the American game. This is not something I see hurting the domestic chickens so much. Outcrossing is a bigger deal than crossbreeding because usually they're breeding hybrids for a specific purpose to increase egg production, meat production. And those birds are not normally bred to. But crossbreeding in American games, it's used for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I I would say... 90% 90% of the time, that's what you're going to see. And basically, it's a short-term plan. It can't go anywhere. Yes, you're going to get hybrid vigor and some benefits from it, but it's such a short-term plan. That one mating, you have to look at it this way. You make one mating, and it's all downhill from there. You're not going to establish a line by doing that. You're not going to establish a family by doing that. And at the time you get there, you're not three or four way cross, five way cross. That's all you've got is crosses. They're going to be different sizes. They're going to be different characteristics, different traits. You're not going to have a consistency in those type birds. We look at uh, American games and we look at the state of the breed itself. And there's so many different bloodlines blended into one and we cling to names, but they don't really mean anything. So anytime you get past a two way cross, you have mongrels. To understand what a true cross is in the sense of the word is a lot of us in the American game file industry, we look at crossing as taking like a sweater and bringing it to a hatch or a Kelso to a hatch. It's always to the hatch, by the way. And that's not a cross at all. That's an outcross if it was true. And we'll get to that in a second. A true cross is actually the crossing of two separate breeds. In this case, what we'd see mostly is like an American game to an ASIL or an American game to a Spanish bird. That's a true cross. And when you got two really good families that's been well-bred, you get what they call hybrid vigor. And that hybrid vigor takes a family that wherever they're at, at that point, you could say that's 100% of their potential. You're not comparing them to other people's birds. You're just comparing them to what you have in your yard. So let's say they're 100%. You breed those two birds together and you get something substantially bigger, better, faster, stronger, smarter. And if you were to give it a percentage, you could be looking at something that's 120 130% of their potential. But the problem is, Frank, is when they breed those together because they get something incredible, this thing looks good, acts good, performs well, I want to breed more of these. They breed them together and they don't realize that it doesn't maintain that percentage of potential, which is the 130%, and it definitely doesn't maintain the original parents, which was 100%. We go down to 80%, and then on top of that, the variables are all over the board. We're talking about complete difference in size, weight, potential, ability, you name it. It's all over the board. And they don't understand that. You're right. And that's a good point, Kenny. What you just explained is they think they hit bottom. That's when they go using other methods because they think they made a mistake. They think that they done something wrong. So they go back to square one again, doing the same thing back over again. And they just keep repeating that, repeating that, repeating that. And it's the same outcome each time. You you see it every day. It's the same outcome each time. And not a good one. Dead Game says, isn't everything across until you establish a family? Any bird peacomb has oriental lineage. Well, let's put it this way. It may answer his question. It's hard for a lot of us to go to someone's farm and get a pure strain to start with. It's not that they don't exist. We just don't get them. Because that breeder doesn't want you to perpetuate his line. So to create a new breed, a lot of times we have to get a cock from someone and a hen from another person, and we put them together. And that's why I create the Founders Program, because you can use that program to create a new strain with whatever you have. You just got to know how to select them properly to get 
through the founders program to create something substantial. So the idea that uh, isn't everything across, well, does that just mean it's okay that I just keep bringing in birds? Because hybrid vigor only works the first time. You can't reproduce a hybrid bird. So once you get two birds, are you going to just keep bringing in new blood? Because at that point, you, all you have done is create mongrels because you don't know what's in there. And the idea of a mongrel is you have a number of different bloodlines or mixtures of bloodlines all put into one bird. So you just got a mixture of genes. The pea comb. Now, if we look at the American game, we have different varieties of American game. And that means different colors of American game, as well as different comb types for American game. Now, American games made up of many different breeds. We have Old English, we have Irish, we have Spanish, we have ASIL, and it could be anything else in there for all we know. But those are the bloodlines we know are there. And yes, the peacomb does come from Oriental blood, but that's what makes the American game different than Old English. People breeding Azel in the American game. If you go back, there's even Irish blood that come over. I've seen different articles on Irish, pea-headed Irish white hackles that come over from Ireland. So was that Oriental blood? Who knows? We can only guess. We really don't know. But uh, is a higher percentage of it Azel? Yes, I would say a high percentage of it would be Azel that was added to it. But I, I think that's where that question was coming from. I think we spoke about it last episode, the Azel being bred into the American game and where would it end up going? Yeah, there's got to be a time when we stop adding new blood and we need to create a breed because we, we haven't found what the American game is. We have a standard, but very few people are actually trying to breed to that standard. So I would say we need to say, OK, that's the end of adding new blood. Let's create a breed. Let's create a strain from that. I think even Bruce Lee said you set a goal and you may never reach that goal. The idea is to come as close to that goal as possible. And breeding chickens is the same way that we want to strive for um, perfection. And every year we get closer and closer. Sometimes we fall back, but we always try to strive for perfection, which each breeding. We should never be putting birds together without trying to achieve a certain result. Would you say, Frank? Yeah. Putting birds together and hoping for the best, that's, that's not, not signs of a good breeder. No, <laughs> no. that's not good signs of a breeder. That's not breeding. That's raising chickens. We're never going to advance as a breeder or... This breed, American Games, never going to advance as a breed until we can, as a group, decide that crossing is a tool and not a method. Bringing in new blood and creating new birds isn't really how it works, that you never really get what you're trying to get. You end up getting a few birds that look promising, but I don't know of anybody who actually crosses birds and says, wow, look at all these birds. They're all perfect. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just doesn't work like that. I'm not going to say we need to get away from crossbreeding. Because it's like inbreeding. It's a great tool, but it's not a breeding method. It has a purpose. Hybrid vigor. We want to produce offspring that are bred to perform a certain function, no matter what it is, domestic or whatever. Okay. And that's what it's meant for. We do not breed to hybrid birds. They have a function, they do their function, and then that's it. We keep them separate from our families, the strains that we're trying to create. Yeah. So, well, the difference about crossbreeding like the hazel to hatch or sweater to hatch, you're going to have a huge gene pool there with the crosses. No two is going to be a lot. They're all going to be different. What you want to do as far as purity to blood, and, and me and Kenny use the purity of blood as in making that gene pool more organized, making it like a filing cabinet, putting good traits in, bad traits out, and you make that gene pool down small as you can get it every year by doing so. With cross foul, the way we're talking about cross and foul, it's just all over the board. It's everywhere. There's no consistency whatsoever there. None. Yeah. Let's move to uh, outcrossing, which is more prevalent in the domestic world because the breeds are more defined. Let's say uh, Leghorn or maybe mm -hmm. even Barred Plymouth Rock. You know when you see a Barred Plymouth Rock. Let's say you have Barred Plymouth Rocks, you breed to another family of birds that are Barred Plymouth Rock. That's what they consider outcrossing. But outcrossing... To improve a trait is very risky, especially when you got an established family. And I see so many strains ruined from outcrossing because they failed to set up sublines. In the American gamefowl industry, there's no such thing as outcrossing <laughs> because the bloodlines are so mixed up. There's so many bloodlines and what we call Hatch or Kelso, they're just not true strains. 
And I don't even know if it's crossing now that I think about it. It's just breeding mongrels. It's just bringing in new blood all the time. So when people think of outcrossing, it's rarely American games that we can add to that because there's no defined bloodline. We can call them sweaters. We can call them hatch, but they're rarely that, if at all. What gets me, they think, because it looks a particular way, its legs are the same color, and it's or straight comb, that they're all the, of the same characteristics. A hatch is a hatch. A white ackle is a white ackle. Uh, a kelso is a kelso. And just because they look the same don't mean they are the same. Let me tell you a story that I dealt with, and I've told this numerous times. I've told it in seminars as well, but it really shows you the dangers of outcrossing. And for some people, this is their first episode they ever listened to, so I think this is going to be really good. Although this is for domestic chickens, this applies to all breeds. Just think of it as yours. So my wife and I were thinking about raising some domestic chickens for eggs and for different purposes, maybe even showing, or just to kind of stretch our legs in that direction. And so we decided on well summers. And I couldn't find anything here. And I don't like relying on hatchery birds because they don't selectively breed. They don't cull substandard birds. They don't cull defects. So what you get is all over the board. You're just not going to get something that represents their breed when you're dealing with hatchery type birds. So we started doing our research. I made some phone calls and asked some friends and tried to get a consensus of who were the best breeders as far as well summers. And what I kept hearing, there was a breeder on the East Coast and there was one here in California on the West Coast. And so I called the one on the East Coast and asked her about her birds, what she could tell me about it. I wanted to get a feel for her breeding methods and where she was with her breeding and her fowl. And everything was sounding really good. And I always asked this of a breeder and you should too. I mean, if you go onto someone's farm and you're looking for birds, I don't care how big this breeder is or how well known they are, they should be able to answer this simple question. What are the common defects in your fowl? And if they say there's nothing, run. Every bird, even my Maximus line has their common defects that I have to look for. And they should be able to tell you that so that when you buy them, you know whether that's a game changer or that's something you can live with. That's something acceptable and that's something that when you breed them, you look for and you can improve them. You can make those hidden. They'll never go away completely, but you can make them hidden. So I asked her that. And she says, well, I'm getting white in the wings. I go, oh, that's interesting. And she said, and this is a big thing with the domestic world these days is egg color. They're forgetting confirmation of body and color, and they're paying attention to egg color. So everything's getting lost because that's all they're concentrating or focusing on is egg color. So she was losing egg color. So she borrowed a rooster from another breeder to put it into her line to improve egg color. And then all of a sudden, a few years down the road, she started getting white in the wings that she wasn't getting before. And I was like, oh, bummer. Okay, so I'll get back to you. I'll think about it. Thank you. I appreciate her honesty. So and then I called the person on the West Coast and asked her the same questions. Everything was sounding good. And I asked her the same question. What are your common defects? And she says, well, I don't know where it comes from, but I get white in the wings. I go, wow, is that a common defect with this particular breed? She goes, I don't know. I know I've got it for a long time and if, I've just had to deal with it. And I says, well, because I just talked to someone on the East Coast who's getting the same thing. And uh, she says, oh, yeah, she's getting that because she borrowed a rooster from me. So the dangers of outcrossing are wide because you can get defects, differences in defects. You can get diseases, you can get lethal genes, you can get all kinds of things that go wrong. So instead of bringing those birds into your birds and doing an outcross, you should be doing sublines and testing that particular bird. So that's more of a problem with domestic chickens, not so much American games, only because, I mean, we can call it outcrossing, but we just don't have defined lines. We don't have defined breeds or defined strains that we can actually call it outcrossing. I'm not even sure we can call it crossbreeding. I think we're actually mongrelizing what we have and we're making them less distinct. And if you go on Facebook, rarely do they look like American games. And that's scary. You know, Frank, I talk to Tony all the time. He's all... Don't worry. These guys will go away. The breed's fine. It'll fix itself. I've always been against that. I don't believe it a little bit. Yeah. Because what if it doesn't? You know, it's what not. If? <laughs> exactly. It's not. Exactly. We physically have to selectively breed them to make them what we want and to improve them. And I don't think that's happening. Well, and that's what I keep preaching. Why rely on another breeder, another person to do your breeding for you? Why not do your own? You know? Yeah. 
they can't say, well, I'm uneducated uh, on chickens. I don't know this about it because they've got that with the Breeders Academy. There is material out there you want to stay away from. But if they are truly wanting the education and wanting to know how to breed right, it's right in front of them. The only thing they have to do is make a dedication and stick with it and do it. And they can do it. I don't know of any other resources out there like the Breeders Academy. I hear there's one, but it doesn't even come close to what we're doing. But to understand where we're at in this industry, and I think in some ways it's the domestic program as well as the game fowl, is when we look at outcrossing and crossbreeding, that's where most of us are starting, and that's where we find our seed fowl. And it's just the reality of it. So is it bad? No, it's just where we're at. Frank actually posts more pictures of his birds than I do. Uh, I saw a comment, of you ever post a bad picture? It just shows that his standards are higher than others, and he's selecting them, and he's breeding them properly. So you're going to see that uniformity, that consistency, and that's really important. This is funny. A few days ago, I saw a guy say that people who inbreed and line breed birds are just too cheap to go buy good birds for crossing. <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 that's the nutshell right there. Yeah. That's how they think, you know. Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, we'll provide you with the roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. I urge you to check it out. You've got nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. I hope to see you there. So let's get started. But you have to look at it this way. Each breeder, each person starting out is going to be different and where they start with the fowl that they start with. You know, some's going to start with more work. Some's going to start with less work. So it all revolves around in what you start with. I told a guy the other day, he had been in chickens. He was wanting to start back doing it again and said, I really don't know if it's something I want to do or not. And I said, well, listen, if it's something that you're not sure about, buy you some mediocre chickens, play with them. See if that's what you want to do. And if so, later on, get you better chickens to start out with. And he said, that's what I'll do. That's not a bad idea. But uh, each person starting out, is going to be at a different level. So Hollis is saying, so crossing is fine as long as you're using crossing for competition, not breeding. Never breed crosses. Never breed hybrids. Unless that's all you can get to start a strain. Those are your seed fowl. But at that point, you're not breeding in new birds all the time. You're looking for birds that are good seed fowl that you can develop a strain from. And I wish I could go into what that means because the Breeder Academy has it in there. It's called the Founders mm-hmm. Program. It takes you step by step. So I'm showing you that it's possible. If you learn how to select properly and know what the results are showing you, you can actually create a strain and it lays it out for you. So yeah, never breed to crosses. Kenny says a million times, guys, you don't have to cross to get hybrid vigor. You can still use your pure fowl and get just as much hybrid vigor if you know what you're doing. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say that it's the one method here that I am leaving out of mm-hmm. this particular talk that will show you how to take a pure family and actually get the hybrid vigor you're looking out without crossing the birds. It's simple. One of my members gave me a message basically saying, wow, the founders program really opened my eyes because without that, I would have just kept bringing a new blood and uh, mixing up the blood all the time. He was talking about how much it opened his eyes. And that's what I get all the time when people look at how well the founders program is laid out and uh, how easy it actually is to create a strain. You just need to, ed- way to go. <laughs> I lost my mic. <laughs> That's okay. I was on a roll. So, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that, Kitty. Craig's saying, Kenny, a big problem is I find very few breeders that are meticulous as you are. And I'm not sure if he's complimenting or what, I, but I think that's, that's the way compliment. everybody should be. Yes. They should be meticulous. It's funner. It actually is. You know, a lot of people say that getting to the foundation stage 
of creating a strain is where you want to go. And you do. That's what you want to get is to the foundation stage, because then you have a, a real uniform and consistent strain that has all the traits you're looking for. But I'll tell you, the funnest part is the transitional stage, because you're going through that and you're doing the steps and you're watching your birds change and improve so much from season to season. It's incredible. The most difficult and the most troubling is the actual the sea fowl, because you really got to start off with the right fowl and get started on the right foot. And that's why I tell people, get into the Breeders Academy, check out some of the programs. I have a start here page that shows you which programs to check out first, and that'll get you started so that you're cleaning up the fowl you have and showing you how to select to get your strain started. Because that is the hardest part, the beginning. And just because you don't know what you're looking for. Yeah, but once you get through that and you hold that bird in your hand that you've created and you're just admiring that bird, there's no other feeling in the world like it. Knowing that you created what you're holding in your hand and it all come out right, that's the best feeling in the world. It's a great feeling. Thanks, Craig. He says it's a compliment for sure. Let's go into backcrossing because there's a huge misconception about backcrossing. Line breeding for back crossing? Yeah, I mean, everybody, <laughs> they go, oh, I line breed my fowl. And when you start talking to them and you figure out what that means to them, all they're doing is a back cross. They're not actually doing line breeding. they are two separate programs or methods to achieve a whole different purpose. And uh, back crossing is what I call an acquisition method where you get your seed fowl and you're trying to get from those seed fowl what you need before you move forward. And uh, sometimes that's one back cross to the original parents. And sometimes it could be multiple. And I usually tell my members that if you look at the offspring from your seed fowl and they're better than the parents, then you do not do a back cross. That's the worst thing you can ever do because then you're breeding backwards. You're going backwards. Okay. A lot of people don't understand that. You would actually move to the next stage if you're seeing that the offspring are better than the parents. So when someone's saying, yeah, I breed to the parents a couple times, it's like, no, that's back crossing. That's not line breeding at all. It's because they're confused. They think they're doing one thing and they're doing another. It's not that they're intentionally doing it. It's just that they don't know they're doing it. Right, Kenny? Yeah, there's a misconception. They've been told that's what line breeding is when it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. I'm not saying that. Right. This is usually a case where they just don't know better. They don't exactly. understand that what they think is line breeding is actually back crossing and they're not achieving the purpose for which they're trying to do it. So it does have a purpose, but you can mess up or muddy your situation or what you're trying to achieve if you do a back cross rather than another line method. Break. Yeah, because that's the telltale sign. If the offspring are better, you do not do a back cross. If they're not as good as the parents, then you do a back cross because we need to try to get more from the parents before we move on. That's all back crossing does. That's it right there. In a nutshell, a lot of people too, Kenny, they'll go too far and just keep going and going, thinking that it's going to get better and they just keep going. And if it's not working, like you said, why keep mm -hmm. going? But they keep going, hoping it will get better. My question is, why are they still back crossing? Yeah. Okay. Because I just laid down the perimeters of back crossing. If you are going too far, let's say line breeding, let's jump to line breeding real quick so you can see the difference. Line breeding has one goal cloning. You don't do a line breeding program unless you have a bird worth cloning. So never move forward with line breeding unless you have a bird that has a proper confirmation, type, color, temperament, performance, has all the traits you're looking for and says, I want more of these. And then if you go too far on the line breeding at that point, then you're going to see the effects of that too. There's a few steps that I'm sorry we're not going to get into that you need to do because if you line breed to what we call the um, dead end zone, that's when you mess up. That's why line breeding fails for so many people is because they go too far or they don't go far enough with line breeding and they hit the dead end zone. And what do they do, Frank? Add more blood. They add more blood from the outside and they screw up everything they did. When I learned the step that fixes that, it was like, oh my God, it was like a, a light bulb went off. And when anybody sees that, it's like that little secret in the middle of a book that you're reading, 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 everything's sounding okay. Yeah, I've heard this before. Boom. You know, you hit that one part, that one section, you go, why didn't I think of that? It's like when I think of like uh, evolution. When I started studying evolution, natural selection, and all the elements that make all that work, it was one of those things that was like, why didn't I think of that? That's simple. Of course, that's how it works. And that's how this particular method 
came to that, me. That's the founders program the, in a nutshell, because without that, it doesn't work. It, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, when you start reading it and putting methods with methods, not method, but methods, it's easy. It's so easy, but you're asking yourself that question. Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I come up with that? It's so easy, but that's the reason that made it so popular to start out with. People get that aha moment. That one thing was leaving out. Line breeding is simple. You're just cloning. You have a bird you want to clone, whether it's a rooster or a hen, and you breed to its descendants over and over again until you get to 15, 16, or 7, 8s, and then you move on to the next stage. And that next stage makes you or breaks you, whether mm-hmm. you do it or not. So that's why I think most people, they shouldn't line breed unless they know what they're doing. Because if you're just going to bring in new blood, and I think this goes back to some of the people who say, oh, my birds are pure. I only add new blood every five or six years. Maybe they are line breeding. Maybe they're back crossing. But when they get to that point when they're starting to see faults, when they start to see issues and they think they mess things up, instead mm-hmm. of going back one generation and then moving from there and then fixing it, they actually add new blood. So if you're going to add new blood every time you run into a problem, then you have no business creating a strain because you're just not. That's just not going to happen. You're just better off just stay crossing. That would be better than actually doing that. I just cringe. And I've talked to some big name breeders who called me. This happened a couple of times where they called me up for birds because they felt that their birds, there was issues with their birds that they didn't think they could fix or they ran into the dead end zone or the birds were getting smaller or whatever. They were blaming all the deficiencies of the bird on the breeding methods that they were using, which wasn't really true. And I just talked them through it. Fine, I'll sell you birds. I don't think that's your issue. I think you need to fix them. I think there's a way to do it. And then I talk them through it. And then I've had a couple of them call me years later and go, whoa, you saved my life. That That's the way to go. Because if you're just going to keep adding new blood, you're not trying to create a strain at all. You're just going to keep messing up everything you're doing. And that, that aha moment we're talking about, Kenny, that will change you about everything. So you're thinking, well, if it was so simple, on this method, what else am I leaving out on these other methods? And yeah, it's the same thing in every method. I guarantee you, if they are using a method, particular method, regardless of what it is, there's something they're leaving out of that method that can make it a whole lot easier and a whole lot better for the fowl. I lo- I'd love to let it out right now, but I'm not going to. Join the Breeders Academy. Check out the Founders yeah. Program. If you have a problem finding it at that point, we'll get on a coaching call and I'll walk you through it. I'll open your eyes. I'm telling you. The truth is, Not everybody's meant to create a strain. I get that. Some people, they just don't have the time, the money, the effort. It's just not something they want to do because it's a project. I've had that happen to me where I almost got to a point where I was like, I may have to add new blood. I may have to fix these another way that I screwed them up. And you'll have those years where you went in the wrong direction. The offspring that year were not better than the parents. And you had to scrap the whole thing and then scratch your head and figure out what to do. That does happen, but you got to know how to get yourself out of it. And that's the key. It's like with anything. Sometimes you got to ask for help. Sometimes you got to re-examine your studies to figure out where you went wrong. That's the best thing about being a member of the Breeders Academy. If they run into that problem, it's not them to figure it out. They've got you. They've got me. Say, hey, I need some help with this. Can you help me? I'm stuck at this point. Just like Kenny said many a times, you just got to have the will to want to go as far as perfect as you can get. My dad always said, give 110%, get 90%. And that's basically how it runs out. You got to give it to y'all. Well, there's some key things in the Breeders Academy and the Founders Program that help you when you get to that point, when you run into a snag or you run into the times that your offspring are actually going in the wrong direction. And it walks you through that. Melissa says some people just won't believe science and genetics. And I do believe that. But I also believe that some people are just scared of the science and the genetics. They think it's too complicated. They're afraid to dive into it and not understand it or how to uh, properly use it. Or they have read it and it was too confusing for them. It didn't make sense and they didn't know how to use it practically. And we see it all the time on Facebook where people are talking about genetics and they talk about it in a way that it's not useful or practical And I think it does confuse people and scares them away from even thinking like that. And I think a lot of people's intimidated. Once you say the word science, they're intimidated by it. But I promise you, if you stick with science, you'll do much better than these old wives tales could ever get you to. Yeah. If I look at my past and I think 
Tony Seville and some others that want to remain nameless. I wish I could name all my mentors, but I can't. They don't want the spotlight. And so I've always respected that. But Tony's, he's in the spotlight. He put himself there. So, But people like that really advanced my skills to the point where not only did I learn what they taught me, but it showed me where to go from there to expand my knowledge. We'll go back to the Breeders Academy. There's nothing out there like it that will advance your skills and take your foul to the next level. I know that's the catchphrase, but it's so true. And it's laid out so well. And I'm in there to help you with any questions you may have. We do coaching calls and I lay it out for you. I make it so you understand it. I never want my members to be lost or confused. I want them to get off the phone with me and have a direction and feel good about where they're going. But yeah, I think mentorship is huge. And I think the Breeders Academy is a good step forward. Hey guys, sometimes you get a real nice looking mutt chicken from a local farmer. The chicks come out semi-true, but I really like the way they look. How would you create my own strain new from that? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Yeah. You can do it. Mm. Will they be what they originated from? No, you can create your own at that point. But again, we can't go into it here, but the Breeders Academy and the Founders Program shows you exactly how to do that. So yeah, it can be done. I, I believe a new breed... In some cases, a new strain can be created from any cock and hen. You just got to know what to do and what to do next. Each person is going to start out, like I said before, different levels. If you have five yeah. people, those five people is going to start out somewhere different because their fowl is going to be different. Some's going to have totally different rooster from a hen. Some's going to have some of the same variety. You just got so many different places that you can start, but that's the best thing about it. And the founders program, you can pick out that spot to where you need to start and go with it. Everybody has got a starting point on there. That's the great part. Alonzo is asking me, how do I get into selling birds? We're not into showing you how to sell them actually. (laughs) Yeah. And that's not something you want to get into. Take my word for it. We're just trying to show you how to create them. Selling is going to be your issue. That's how you, okay. So, Melissa saying, I made more progress in one generation with my I am tsunamis with the support and education that you guys provide at the Breeders Academy than a lot of other people that have been involved with the breed for many years. Mm -hmm. The reason I pulled that up is because that shows you that it doesn't matter what breed you're raising. The principles and the practices inside the Breeders Academy works for all chickens. Matter of fact, it works for a lot of different types of animals. I don't just have chicken breeders in there. I I lose track of what they all are. I got quail breeders, turkey breeders, duck breeders. I have dog breeders, sheep breeders, fish. Yeah, Yeah. I'm losing count of all of them. I think I have a horse. I have a cattle breeder and I might have a horse breeder in there too. And they're finding elements of the Breeders Academy that are working for them. And then they're also finding elements of the founders program that's working for them as well. Yeah, like we've always said, a trait's a trait. Of course, the animals to chickens can be a little bit different, but still, a trait's a trait. Well, if you go into the books, the agricultural books, whether it's chickens or animal breeding, I have animal breeding and chicken breeding books, both of them. And you look at the methods, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. They use the same exact methods. There are some limitations when you go to animals because inbreeding can be an issue if you do that wrong where birds can take a lot more inbreeding before you reach inbreeding depression. So let's actually go into inbreeding a little bit, which I look at as a consolidation of traits. It's actually a cleansing of traits. To me, it's not a breeding method. It's actually a tool. And it's used to achieve a specific purpose and to achieve a specific result. Now, I just noticed on Facebook recently, there's a huge thread on inbreeding and a handful of people actually were understanding it. They were actually getting it right. They were doing a really good job at it, which I put my like on there. I was really, yeah, here we go. I think we're making some progress here with some people. But there were some people that got it so wrong. There's such a misunderstanding, Frank, when it comes Terrible. to what inbreeding is all about. Yeah, because I think a lot of them, Kenny, they use it as a method rather than a tool. And I'm going to say this, and I've said it many times, do not attempt a brother, sister mating, unless you do know what you're doing, please. That's right. Because yep. even starting out, you can do so much damage just by not doing it properly. I can't stress the importance of that. What I noticed too from that thread was people really misunderstood what inbreeding was all about. Now, when you're doing an inbreeding, like I said, it's a tool. It's about consolidating the genes in such a way that you could select the standouts to move your fowl forward. It's not about producing offspring 
that are all superior. That's not what it's about at all. Okay. Because from that, you're going to get quite a few that are substandard and defective. And we're talking about some serious defects. And sometimes it can mean like in this one picture where the chick was actually missing a leg. Now that can be a duplication of genes, but it can also be a mutation and mutations come in many ways. And maybe we'll do a whole show on mutations. Mutations, not as simple as it sounds. There's about six different variations of mutations that can happen. Color being one. White. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, my birds produce white. Well, that's a mutation. (laughs) Yeah. So we call it a sport, but it's actually a mutation. And then from that, you're going to get some that are just kind of mediocre. They're not going to be great. They're not going to be bad, but they're not going to be what you'd want to advance your strain with. And then you're going to get a handful of birds, which I call the standouts. They're going to be what you're looking for. So I always tell people, produce as many chicks as you can hatch and maintain and afford, because that's going to give you a bigger and better selection to get the standouts that you need. In a lot of cases, when you're creating a strain, all you really need, let's say you hatch 100 chicks or more from an inbreeding program. Truthfully, all you need is one cock and one hen to move forward with. And those are going to be the standouts. Those are going to carry the traits that you're looking for. I was looking at this thing and they were, that's why you don't want to inbreed because you get this and you get that. And they're picking on that one bird that had the worst faults. And that's what inbreeding does. That's what you want. You want to produce offspring that show that kind of variation so that the standouts express themselves in a way that you can pick them and then move your fowl forward and you get rid of the rest. So they were just missing what inbreeding was all about. The comments on that, Kenny, I seen a couple of them on there talking about the reason they was getting bad results because they was breeding junk genes to junk genes. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) That that doesn't mean one thing. That's just letting you know what's in that pair of chickens in genetics. Just showing you what's inside of their gene banks. Like Kenny said, you're going to get the worst of the worst, the mediocre, and then some top-notch standout type chicken. But selection is key in any form of of breeding, but particularly in breeding, selection is a must. Yeah, Uh, inbreeding is great because you consolidate those genes in a way that you get those kind of results, and that's what you're looking for. If they were all perfect, that'd make me scratch my head, actually. (laughs) Okay, what the hell happened here? That's not supposed to happen. So Alonzo says, so if the mutt chickens are siblings, can you still create families from there? And I would say that's not where you start the family. There's a lot more that has to happen before you actually get to the creating a family. When you're breeding siblings together, you're still in the consolidation and the cleansing mode. So I would say, no, you're trying to jump the gun, actually. Yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done. Before you get to that, a lot. He was also saying that he's uh, planning on joining the Breeders Academy soon. Hey, Alonzo, when you join, let's get together. We'll do a coaching call, and I'll walk you through the Founders Program, and I'll show you exactly how that plays out. Yeah, you don't want to jump the gun. That's not how it works. Like we said, inbreeding is not a method. It's a tool. It's a great tool for intensifying the genes, for creating a strain. But the idea of it is it makes the process faster. You can do it without inbreeding, but it's a long process, and sometimes you never get there. That's where inbreeding is such a great tool. That's what makes us a great team, and I'd never want that to be lost, that you just buy good genetics and you go from there. The environment has to be good. The nutrition has to be good, or you're just never going to see that potential, and therefore, you're not going to know what to select, and I never want that to get lost at all. See, Craig says, I'm going to be re- relocating, starting fresh. I hope there will be an opening in the Breeders Academy in a few months. I was thinking about closing the doors, but the only thing I can say is depends on how many members we get. If we start getting to what I feel is too many, then what I would probably do is up the price for membership to control that influx of members. I do need to be able to help my members be able to do the coaching calls that we're doing, answer the questions that are being asked. And if I feel like I'm not getting to that, that could be a problem. I do know that I do have an outlet that once we start getting to that point, I trust Frank. Me and Frank think a lot alike when it comes to breeding. He understands the website. He understands the founders program. And we may get to that point where if I start feeling like I'm getting too many, that I may have some people go to Frank first and then maybe me later. I think you'll get great advice from Frank. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I think Frank's going to do a good job and he's going to be there to look after your best interests and he understands everything really well. So that's something that would help keep me from having to up the price for a while. 
but that would be the only thing you'd have to worry about is if we got like a thousand members in there. We're in the hundreds right now. We are. But uh, if we get close to a thousand, then I may have to rethink that a little bit. So just so you know. Also, once you get in there, the price never changes. You're locked into that price. No matter how many times I change the price, it will never change for you unless you go out and come back in. So I always warn people, if you're thinking about quitting or taking a break, you might want to think about that. That's a great part of the actual membership not changing. That's great. And you can also go down to like the apprenticeship level, which is a cheaper way to go. You don't get the whole website, but you get some really good stuff in there. So if you need a downsize, you can do that too. But I would advise you to keep your membership going as long as you can, because I'm always adding new information. We're adding new programs all the time. I'm always improving the founders program. And uh, we're getting ready to uh, produce a lot more videos. We're starting with the founders program. So for those who have canceled in the past, come back. I mean, you're going to see a whole new website and it's just going to keep getting better from here. And I'm getting a lot more help. So it's going to be getting to be a lot easier. They would so, the ones that's left, they come back. They're not going to recognize it either. You well, know? I've had a few people come back and say that. Wow. I thought I was in the wrong website. It you know, totally the founders different. program is so much better now. I went in so, one night and come back and said, I was telling Kenny, I said, I thought I was in the wrong place there for a second. Yeah, you, you, know, did, you said that too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we're always looking for ways to improve it. My members are always giving me ideas on ways to make it easier and more navigational. And I'm creating start here pages. So I love the website. It's so cool. Some of the questions I get are, what's the downsides inbreeding? Because there are. I mean, inbreeding, like I said, it's not a method. It's a tool. It does produce birds with bad traits. Now, although it can cause inbreeding depression, it takes a long time to get there. Now, where most people reach inbreeding depression is because they're missing some key elements. They're not breeding and selecting for good vigor. That's one of the first things to go. And they're not selecting for good health. They go hand in hand. Now, I know some people that inbreed over and over again, almost every year, which is kind of insane, but they do a good job of it and they get really good results because they're very observant of health and vigor. If you start thinking you're getting inbreeding depression, and I've heard people say, oh, yeah, I inbreed it last year and I got all these problems. You're not going to get those problems in one inbreeding. You're not going to reach inbreeding depression in one breeding. That takes many years of inbreeding to get there. And where you're going to see it is in the baby chicks in that they're not going to hatch. And if they do, they're going to be very weak, lethargic. They're not going to have any vitality whatsoever. And a lot of times, if you just cull those, which some of them do cull themselves right off the bat, and you select the ones that have good vigor and good health, it fixes itself. So you're always looking for the best birds. Whenever you do an inbreeding, you're always looking for the best birds, the birds that have the good conformation of body, good type, color, temperament, all that. Now, if you're going to accept some of those bad traits, then you're going down the wrong road. Then inbreeding is going to bite you in the butt. It's not exactly inbreeding depression, but it is going to bite you in the butt. That's why I always call it a tool. So just understand that selection is key and you got to cull ruthlessly. If you're not going to be willing to cull, don't inbreed because you're going to get some birds that you need to cull. And it can be substantial. It can be a lot of birds actually. So just don't do inbreeding haphazardly. Anything you want to say about that, Frank, before we move on? No, because uh, you, you hit it right on the head. Well, I just want to make sure we covered it right because of that thread on Facebook. And I told yeah. a lot of people, I can see by our numbers that I'm sure a lot of them are over here <laughs> watching this. And I want to make sure I do it right because these people, I could tell some of them really got it. And both me and you said that was really cool. We were really proud. Like, whoa, people are yeah. starting to get it. But there was some that just missed it completely. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of these breeders that's used it and used it right and I know a couple was to even telling me, whatever you do, do not ever inbreed. They didn't want people using that technique. They didn't want nobody around that. So that's where a lot of that come to be. These older breeders telling people to stay away from it because they didn't want people doing it because it yep. was such a good way of doing it. But good uh, breeders understand the value of inbreeding. They, yes, they really do. They know. really do. And like you said on, on the forum, Breeders' cabinet members know all too well of how important tool uh, inbreeding is. His alias on the website is <laughs> Oregon. I'm blessed to be a member of the Academy. I've learned a lot. He is very supportive. More power to you guys. That's really good. One of the things I hear a lot 
is when they say they don't inbreed or the closest they come to inbreed, and they use this as what they think of as inbreeding, the safe mode, which is basically a maintenance mode. And that's in and in breeding, which simply means that you're talking about uncle to niece, aunt to nephew, cousin to cousin. That is inbreeding in the sense of the words. Line breeding can be considered inbreeding in some ways. True inbreeding is brother and sister. Now, when you're doing those kind of inbreedings, which is in an inbreeding, uncle to niece, aunt to nephew, cousin to cousin, it's an okay maintenance program, but you really get very low impact on creating a strain. You really have problems improving specific traits. If you're trying to improve traits, that's a very slow way to go. And it's almost impossible to achieve any certainty of uniformity or consistency. It's kind of their way of inbreeding, but not inbreeding. And it just doesn't do the job. It's not intense enough. Inbreeding. No, it's not intense enough. I think it's like cousin to cousin or uncle to these. I think it's like uh, what? 12 and a half percent. I'd have to look it up. I do have a chart that shows those different percentages from inbreeding to line breeding to in and inbreeding. It shows those percentages and it breaks it down really good. I got to find it. I might even have it on the Breeders Academy. I got to figure out where I put it, but I might not even put it on there because I don't want people really doing that. In and inbreeding, it's one of the worst methods to use to create a strain and you just don't make the progress you think you're going to make. In some ways, unless you're a good selector and a good culler, in and inbreeding doesn't improve anything. So, Super slow. Yeah, super slow and sometimes non-existent <laughs> at times. So Travis is asking, is it okay to line breed those offspring back to the parents? Okay, no, because then you're breeding in reverse. You want to move on. The seed fowl have one job, and that's to get the strain started. The only time you want to breed back to the parents is in a back crossing because you're not getting what you want. The offspring are not better than the parents. If the offspring are better than the parents, you want to move on. So moving back to the parents, you just introduce all those traits, all that bloodline that you were working on and trying to get out of them, you just put right back in. That's what's nice about the Founders Program. It prevents you from moving backwards. It keeps you moving forward because that's where a lot of people fell. They breed the birds and then they get into a problem. They breed back to the parents. They just introduce all those genes right back in there. And that's not what we want to do. Once we realize that the seed fowl have done their job, we get rid of them. I mean, I'm not going to tell you to kill them or cull them or sell them exactly. You can keep them off to the side, but you've got to have some kind of discipline not to introduce them back into the family and screw everything up. So that would be a not good thing to do. Okay. <laughs> so, And that's a problem for a lot of people. And like Kenny said, you have to get past that because if you put those back in there at any time, you're back at zero again. You know, That's right. Yeah, might as well just bring in new blood completely. If you just keep breeding them, you're just producing a lot of offspring unless you're going to create separate lines. But I don't know a lot of people can manage that many lines for one thing. That's a lot of lines. It would be really tough. And to keep them all straight, let's say on one line, you're in stage three, but yet you're still breeding the seed fowl. What happens if you mix them up? You need to keep really good records. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying... Be careful because seed fowl, like I said, a lot of times if you do a good job of producing offspring from them and you get what you need to move forward, those seed fowl are only going to hurt you down the road rather than help you. And, and let me go back one step too, because when you're back crossing, a lot of people make the mistake when they do the back crossing. Let's say they get the offspring, the offspring are not better than the parents. So they decide, okay, I need to take it back to the parents one more time. This is where they fail. They breed to both parents. You need to pick one of those parents to be the dominating parent and say, okay, I need to take it back to the parents. So I like the cock. I like the traits of the cock better than the hen or vice versa. So I'm going to breed the offspring to that particular bird, not the other one. And you keep doing that till you get the offspring that you want. People make the mistake of back crossing to both parents at the same time. All you did was create. I mean, if you're going to create two separate lines, that's one thing. I don't know how many people can manage that and keep it straight. But uh, usually one parent is better than the other. And that's what you want to go to. I, I left that step out. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, step. I agree. Instead of in and in breeding, which is uncle to niece and aunt to nephew or cousin to cousin, which is what people look at as a safe approach. And I guess it is if you're afraid of inbreeding. I have another alternative, which would be a rotational system. Now, some people will call it clan mating. Some people will call it spiral mating. I don't like those because uh, a lot of people don't really understand what that means, but 
what they basically are, it's a rotational program where you're rotating the birds each year. And uh, this is a great way, if you're looking for a method to maintain your line and still maintain some genetic diversity, but you don't want to bring any outside blood, then I would say a clan mating system or spiral mating system is the best way to go. And uh, we teach that in the Breeders Academy too. But I just don't think it's a great system by itself. Because it's such a great maintenance system and you're not going to make a lot of progress, you can only cull so many birds because when it comes to this kind of a system, the numbers matter. They really do because you're basically creating one family, a number of lines, okay? All the hens and offspring stay within their particular line, but each year you're rotating the cock to the next line. That's where you're maintaining the genetic diversity. You're maintaining the family without breeding in any outside blood. That's a great method for maintenance. It's a great method for maintaining genetic diversity, but it's not for improving the strain. So I always tell people, create on the side, parallel to that system, an improvement program, in which we lay it all out in the Breeders Academy. But the improvement program running parallel to the rotational program really works because it's the offspring from the improvement program that are not being used in improvement program the following year, but are still really good fowl. You've culled through them. You've got the good temperament. You've got the good confirmation type color. They're really good birds. You've culled through the bad ones. You can integrate them into the rotational program. And that's what also helps improve the rotational program. So that's what I usually tell people is run those two parallel to each other. That's an eye opener to a lot of people too, with this maintenance type mating a lot of people ask me, I, I have a, a yellow, orange, and green bands that I keep on each family. And I get more comments of that. Well, why you got orange on this one, green on this one for it? And when I tell them it's a maintenance type breeding, they have no clue what I'm talking about. Spiral, clan, you can call it what you want. They're like, that's a wonderful idea. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. that light bulb comes on over their head. But yeah, we're getting to the end here. So The next one would be double mating. And we talked about this earlier. I don't really promote this method because I like to be able to put birds together and know that they're going to hatch off offspring that are representative of them. And when you're dealing with a double mating system, you have a hen's line and a cock's line. And here's a good example. And it really made me decide not to raise well summers because of this, because I was talking to Matt Hemmer who's a big Will Summers breeder. And we got to talking because when I finally did get my Will Summers, I noticed that I was able to get the cock color right, but I couldn't get the hen color right at the same time. It's like the cocks had a nice black breast. They were beautiful. I was calling all the birds with red in the breast, but the hens were coming out really foxy. They were losing their stippling, their partridge plumage, and they were looking terrible. And so I was like, okay, something's not right here. And I thought I just had a really bad strain. I couldn't seem to fix it. And I learned from him to get the right color of hen. I had to have those cocks with the red in the breast. The partridge hens produce the red breasted cocks. And I didn't like the red breasted cocks. So I was like, okay, we're back to double mating. And see, that's the problem. You need to maintain those different colors and mix them in a way that produces the colors you're looking for. And so that means you can't produce a family that's true to color. You can't perfect the color. You'll never improve that color. So I kind of cringe when I get a member who says, I've got this particular breed. We do the research. We realize that he or she has to use double mating. It's a tough way to go. It really is. For an experienced breeder who understands their birds and understands that by mating this with this, you get that. And be willing to accept that. And that's just not for me. To me, that's not creating a strain. Joran is saying, I hope I said that right. Uh, well, summer cocks are supposed to have red modeling. Yeah. And I like the black breasted red. I like the party color that you get with it, but I don't like the red breast. So that was a problem with me. I just think that's a really bad way to go. And I don't think you can create a strain that way. And for some of these people that are into the showing and they're okay with breeding birds like that to get a good show bird, that's fine. I just don't think that's a great way to create a strain. Yeah. Anything that has to have maintenance on that, I don't think I'd enjoy that part of constantly have to do that. That would take the fun out of it with me. Another method is recombinant reciprocal selection. Mm -hmm. Always a tongue twister for some people. Is for me too. (laughs) And this is a system that a lot of big time breeders are using. They just don't know what it's called. 
And this works for them, but it doesn't work for the people buying birds from them. And what's happening is they have two pure families and they cross them to each other. And then they sell the offspring from that. And so basically what you're buying, and I doubt they're, in most cases, they're not advertising that's what they're doing. They're saying, this is my such and such, okay? And you're getting them and they look great. They're awesome. They prove themselves in every way. The first breeding, you kind of get away with decent offspring from them and you start bragging to everybody, go, oh, go to this person. He's got the best birds. I did really well with them. They're the best birds I've ever seen. Then they go breed them another generation and everything all falls apart. Yep. And that's from that type of system. Now, another way they do it is they take it a step farther is that they give you a bird from one family and then they give you a hen from another family so that you go breed them. You produce those hybrids and you're even more impressed. Mm -hmm. And then after the second breeding, they fall apart. And you're like, what the hell happened? So I'm going to go talk to the breeder, figure out what I did wrong, get some more birds and see if that works. And it happens again, two years down the road. So this is a very ingenious way of controlling your bloodline, the integrity of your bloodline without letting the true bloodline out of your yard and make money. It's used in the commercial industry. It's used by a lot of backyard breeders and it's used by some of the bigger breeders and everything in between. It's a pretty common method, but kind of misleading. Oh yeah, very misleading. And you're right. But the thing about it is when that person hits the low spot on the third and fourth breeding, you said, oh, they think they made a mistake. It's on their part. They go back, buy another $500 a bird for the same breeder. They go two more years, then they go back again. They keep going back. So really it's a scam is what it is actually. Yeah, it because is. a lot of those breeders know what they're doing, Kenny. And they're taking advantage of people trying to get give birds to breed. A question I get a lot, Frank, is uh, what methods are used more often? What would you say? I'd say line, line breeding. Been, if it's been true line breeding. breeding. Yeah, if it's true yeah. line breeding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and not bad breeding. Yeah. But I would say that one most because really, to be honest, Kenny, 90% of the people that I talked to about breeding at one time thought line breeding or back breeding was the only thing that you had to do. Breed brother to sister, no. Breed uncle to niece, niece to uncle, and... Never hit a wall. Just keep on doing that over and over and breed the best of the best. That's usually the take on breeding. Yep. Crossbreeding is probably, I think, the most used. You well, know, yeah. Just because it's simpler for most people. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Line breeding, if it's true line breeding, most people are actually back crossing. We're going to lose Karen here pretty soon. So you guys got to remind me to push the button for the, the outro right. this time. Okay. So we'll see Karen next week. Sorry She's about got that, something. Kenny. Nope, it's okay. okay. Thanks, Karen. I was going to type that in there, but I can't talk about one thing and type the other. So <laughs> I'm just, just going to let her go because we're getting to the end, anyways. You know, another question I get is what methods will give you the most success? And my answer to that is none by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the importance of having a breeding program that the methods by themselves don't really accomplish the goal. They have a specific purpose, a specific function. They'll produce a certain result, but only to get you to the next step. The problem is most people are using methods as their only method, their only way of breeding and thinking that they're going to achieve what they need from there. When in truth, one method will lead to the next, to the next. And uh, they're just not standalone. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that it's not the breeding method that's important. It's the program. And the Founders Program does lay it out really well, although I haven't seen a lot of programs that I was impressed with that I thought did a good job of using these different methods in the right sequence. But I'm sure there's some out there. Someone can show me one that's better than the either. Founders Program. I haven't either. I haven't. No. But wh what I like about it, the Founders Program, each method has an end result. Keep from hitting the wall. The next step yeah. pulls you out of that. When you start to hit the wall on that method, the next step pulls you out of that. So you're constantly taking your chickens out of harm's way, so to speak, and putting them in a fresher spot, begin another course with. So that's what I like about it. One complements the other. It not only complements it, but I think each method sets up the next one. It does. Really well. It does. That's you a good know. way to put it. Yeah, we're always looking for ways to improve it to make it even easier. Well, I've said it a million times, and I know it works because me and Kenny, without mentioning their names, know of many breeders have used parts of this and had successful fowl for 50-plus years. It's proven 
It's not guess, old wives' tales. It's proven fact that it works. And many guys, professional breeders, has used it over the years. So we know it works. That's the key. I mean, you can use this program forever. You shouldn't have to ever bring in outside blood. If you follow this program and select properly, because you do need to know how to select the birds. And that's what the articles are in the Breeders Academy. That's what they help you do. It sets you up so that you understand what birds to select and why and set you up for the Founders Program. Because if you don't know how to select them and you don't know what makes up a good bird, you're just going to be spinning your wheels. The Founders Program doesn't work if you don't know how to select them. That's true. It's very understandable to teach you that to be selective. Yeah, and that's a good point to make because not everybody starts from the beginning. They could start at different places in the founder program depending on the fowl that they have. And uh, people say best of the best. And that's my first indication that they don't understand the breeding process. That's a cop out. You know, I just breed best of the best. It just means I don't know what I'm doing, but this is the best way I can do it. Yeah, um, I but, agree. Uh, there's some people who like breeding best of the best in breeding. You know, Tony and I, we go back and forth. If you listen to our last podcast on the misconceptions of breeding, you'll see a big section there where we go back and forth on inbreeding and we just plainly disagree about inbreeding. He looks at it as the worst thing ever. And I look at it as one of the best tools ever. And I could argue with him forever. And he's like, oh, okay, I'll say this, but I got to say this, that inbreeding is not the way to go. And I felt like going, well, okay, but I say that it is. I was like, you know what? We're never going to move forward if I don't just let it go. But too now, and science supports inbreeding. It's there. It supports it. It says that it yeah. works. So even though Tony, he's old school, he's got his ways, and you have to respect that. But science does actually say that inbreeding works if used right. So... Yeah, uh, that's what yeah. you got to look at. The I have plenty of books it. over here. We should share them someday. That that's all they talk about is inbreeding, mm-hmm. the benefits of inbreeding, how inbreeding works, the pros and cons. The article that I wrote inside the Breeders Academy is one of the first places I send them next to defects and confirmation. I send them to the inbreeding section because I know they're going to get to that point and they're going to hit a snag. They're going to go, oh no, I heard this is the worst thing ever, and these are all the problems that are associated with inbreeding. And I'm like, go in there. I have a great program. It talks about the pros and cons, how it works and why it's beneficial and why it's not a method, but a tool and how it can speed up the breeding process. I'm a firm believer. You cannot create a strain without inbreeding. You can't, but you just got to know how to do it properly. That's all. And I also believe that if you don't understand it and you don't know what you're doing, then don't do it because you're just going to mess things up. It can be everything they say it is. If you don't know what you're doing, it can be the worst thing ever. I concur. I think we covered this pretty well. I want to encourage everybody to join the Breeders Academy. Give it a chance. Uh, We can get together on a coaching call. A lot of answers that you're looking for are there. Um, I think you'll find it useful and practical. If you really want to create a strain or improve your established strains, I think it's a website that's for you. I want to thank Karen. She's not here, but thank Karen for producing it. She did pawn the last part of it on me. I'll have to. Hmm. And I want to thank Frank and I want to thank our audience for joining us and providing your comments and questions. So you guys help shape the show and we do it for you. So we'll see you guys next week. Okay. Thanks for listening. Yes, thank you again for joining us on the Bread to Perfection podcast show. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where by becoming a member, you can increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and take you and your fowl to the next level. We can also show you how to create a strain from hybrid crosses or mongrel flocks and help you to create, maintain, and improve your present strains. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel anytime. To join us at the Breeders Academy membership website, go to www.breedersacademy.com. Best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. While you're checking out the Breeders Academy, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, The Breeders Bulletin. We provide a lot of free bonus materials and some great information that will take you and your file to the next level. Well, that's it for now. We hope you join us next time for another episode of Bread to Perfection. We'll see you later. Bye.